the scale globally is really quite remarkable, and one can't help feeling that if it was another disease, like Ebola virus, it would get a much higher priority. But we're all so comfortable with alcohol; it's, it's so entrenched in our, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives that it's very hard to persuade people the, the scale of the problem. Uh, of all the continents, Europe is the is the heaviest consuming continent, and uh, if you look at alcohol in Russia in the last 10, 50 years, it's it, it's decimated the the male population in, in a way that HIV did in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so it really is a huge problem. I think the, 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 the expectation of, of, of males in Russia fell by about 10 years when Yeltsin came in and they uh, deregulated uh, over the availability of alcohol. The increase in consumption we've, we've seen in the UK over the last 20, 30 years isn't unique to us. If you look at the, at the consumption uh, curve over the last 20 years for China, it mirrors ours exactly, but it starts at a much lower level. But there's no doubt that the global, global industry is moving into developing countries, and I think some of the social norms there will change. I think we will see women uh, catching up with their European counterparts over the next 10, 20, 30 years, and there is this narrowing of the differences between, between countries as there's more travel as, as, as the multinational companies uh, push their same policies uh, throughout the world. Well, alcohol is, is a risk factor in many non-communicable diseases. Uh, it's not just cirrhosis, which everybody thinks of, but there's, you know, there's, uh, there's hypertension, there's stroke, there are various cancers. And if you look at the WHO's own figures for risk factors for a man dying before the age of 60 or disability adjusted life years lost from risk factors uh, looking at things like tobacco uh, unsafe sex diabetes hypertension alcohol comes out as number one the biggest single risk factor for a man uh, globally dying before the age of 60 and this is really because alcohol tends to kill people uh, relatively young. It tends to be when people are in their most productive phase of their life. Now, tobacco clearly kills more people overall, but much more often in, the la in, their, la in, in their later life. So alcohol is a key risk factor in, in productivity in the workforce. I mean, the scale of the problem we're seeing from alcohol is huge, uh, obviously globally, but also in individual countries like the UK. And we see a range of harms from one end of the spectrum, it's the, it's the harms from getting drunk that we're seeing in young people who are binge drinking. And those dangers are uh, you know, violence, uh, accidents, unwanted pregnancies, etc. Uh, just basically losing control. Uh, but the other end of the spectrum, we've got the consequences of, of long-term chronic consumption. And that tends to be seen more in older populations. It tends to be things like cirrhosis of the liver, uh, cancers, uh, hypertension, and so on. So there's this, this spectrum. And within the population, we see not just this young person, old person divide, but also a gender divide. Um, if you go back uh, 50 years, it was, it was probably socially unacceptable to see a woman you know, drinking in a, in a pub or bar. Now it seems to be socially acceptable for women to be lying in the street on a, on a Saturday night. So we've got a, 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 a cultural change. Um, it's interesting, if you look at young people, they drink less often than older people, but when they drink, they drink more. Uh, older people drink less on any one occasion, but are likely to drink more frequently. And many, many uh, 50, 60, 70 year olds are drinking on a nightly basis. Probably about a quarter of the population over 65 will drink uh, every day or six days a week. And Many of them will come to no harm, but uh, there are increasing numbers of, of older people coming into uh, hospitals with head injuries, falling down the stairs when they've been less than steady uh, late in the evening. Uh, in young people, there are tragedies like um, paraplegias and quadriplegias from, from young people diving into uh, shallow swimming pools in the, you know, in the small hours of the of, of the morning and, and breaking their necks. And so there's a, there's a spectrum of harm we're seeing uh, uh, that varies between the young and the old, uh, men and women.
Well, we have a very strong evidence base on what works. Uh, we know that the amount of harm you see in a population, whether it's at a village, uh, at a city, country, or continental level, we know that the evidence uh, is that the, the more a population drinks, the more harm it sees. And we know that the drivers of how much harm we see are basically price, uh, availability, and marketing. And of those three, uh, price is probably the single most important factor. It's rather like cigarettes. If you, if you plot consumption against price, there's a very tight inverse relationship. So we have, the, we have, in a sense, the policy tools. The policy tools are not always uh, very popular with governments. And this is in part because they see um, alcohol as one of the, the pleasures of the voter, and they're worried about losing votes if they implement uh, policies uh, such as uh, putting up the price or, or banning advertising. Uh, but they're also uh, quite clearly from uh, recent publications strongly influenced by the drinks industry. Uh, the, the drinks industry has become very much global, very much multinational, uh, and the influence of the drinks industry is absolutely huge. And uh, now in the UK, for example, it's not just the, the producers, it's the retailers, it's the supermarkets that are perhaps the main cause that we've seen a, um, a huge increase in, in um, drinking at home, drinking cheap uh, supermarket drink. Uh, people in the UK now don't want to spend uh, seven or eight pounds on a single drink when they can buy the whole bottle and drink it at home. And this has led to a change of culture. Uh, Drinks industry, when they've debated with me, say this is not nothing to do with price or availability. This is an issue of culture. Well, the culture in the UK has changed completely in the last 10 to 20 years because of the availability of cheap, off-license supermarket drink. If you go back 10, 20 years ago, most alcohol was consumed in pubs, bars, restaurants. Now, for everything except beer, about 75% plus of alcoholic beverages are consumed at home. That doesn't mean to say the person that, that doesn't mean to say that the person necessarily stays at home, and we've got this this uh, uh, culture of, of front loading or preloading, where young people will, uh, so to speak, tank up on alcohol before they go out, and then they will just keep topped up uh, uh, with a small amount of alcohol at the more expensive prices. Or even now, people talk about side loading, which is between pubs, bars, and clubs, they'll go to an off-license, buy a cheap bottle, top up, and then go on with their, uh, their night out. I think there's a huge variability across the world as to uh, how much they have embraced the, the evidence uh, on price, on availability, on marketing. Uh, there are some shining examples, for example, France, where uh, historically have had very high levels of consumption and harm, have seen dramatic falls in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Now this isn't solely because of regulation and there have been changes in culture there, but uh, there's no doubt at all that some of their measures like having a complete ban on alcohol companies sponsoring sports events and musical festivals, uh, like a complete ban on broadcast advertising, these have almost certainly been uh, rather important. Um, in contrast, if you come to the UK, uh, there are alcohol adverts at half-time in, in Premier Soccer games. Within the games, there are um, visual cues. Uh, youngsters see uh, something to do with alcohol every 20 seconds, either on the player's shirt or on an advertisement on a billboard round the ground. So uh, France has really been quite tough, and the UK has a remarkably lax regulatory framework. If you go to developing countries, uh, obviously it's even uh, uh, less well regulated. There are worrying developments where some alcohol producers are now going around the world offering to help countries write their alcohol strategies, which I have to say doesn't strike me as being um, the most sensible public health policy. In the UK, we had a, a glimmer of hope that there would be a real evidence-based policy instituted when the Prime Minister David Cameron came out in favour of a minimum unit price. This is a minimum floor price where you can't sell alcohol per unit strength below a certain amount. And it's a very attractive policy because not only does it tackle uh, 
cheap drink, but it targets uh, the people you most want to target because a minimum floor price tackles the cheapest alcohol and we know that the heaviest drinkers and the underage drinkers gravitate to that cheapest drink. A lot of the evidence around it was, was circumstantial and modelling uh, a minimum unit price, but in the last two or three years some really important data is coming out of Canada where in some states like Saskatchewan they've in effect had a minimum floor price for some years and when they increased that floor price by 10%, they actually saw a dramatic fall in alcohol-related harm. Indeed, they saw a 30% fall in deaths directly attributable to alcohol. So we've now got real-life evidence that a minimum unit price is a highly effective policy. Unfortunately, the present government has let it roll into the long grass for the moment, concerned both, I think, about the uh, concerns of voters and also from pressure from the drinks industry. I think the challenge facing public health is to get governments to embrace uh, these evidence-based policies. But perhaps in order to help governments, uh, I think we also have to try and uh, get the uh, general public on side. I think if you stop someone in the street on Friday evening and ask them if they'd like to pay more for their uh, weekend bottle of wine, they're not going to say yes. But there is evidence if it's put in the context of the harm that their local communities are seeing from alcohol, then you get a different answer. You know, there's hardly a family that hasn't been touched in some way by, by alcohol, whether it's a, a children of dependent parents or, or a victim of, of violence or, uh, or the whole manner of, of, uh, of harms that we see. Uh, and it's interesting that actually it was the um, debate about passive smoking, uh, non-smokers being exposed to, to other people's smoke that really swung the argument uh, behind banning smoking in public places. But of course the harm to third parties is hugely greater from alcohol and I think that's a message we need to, to uh, pick up on and mobilise uh, public opinion. I think it's very difficult to know where we're going with alcohol. I think we're seeing uh, different patterns in different countries, but on the other hand, there's also perhaps a convergence as uh, these multinational companies become dominant, and so uh, they're drinking the same in the, in the bars of Mumbai as they are in, in New York and London. Uh, of course, in, in um, developing countries, there's still a huge problem in rural areas where, where uh, local spirits are distilled, uh, local beers are produced and often contaminated and, uh, and causing harm through that route. So I just don't quite know how it's going to play out. I think in all countries we have a, a rather ambivalent attitude towards alcohol. It's quite hard to talk about alcohol without smiling because we associate it with having a good time. It's hard to envisage a celebration in the UK now without alcohol being in the centre. And you don't get that same sort of uh, um, attitude around smoking. Most smokers in their heart of hearts know that they're addicted and would like to stop if they could. Most drinkers don't want to stop. And I think it's that sort of cultural um, barrier that we have to get through. Now, of course, we don't want everybody to stop drinking. That's not the, that's not the, the end game. But nonetheless, if we could just get the whole consumption curve shifted down by, you know, by 10 or 20 percent, if we could get back to where we were in the UK, say, 30, 40 years ago in our per capita consumption, we would see a huge benefit uh, in health. I think one of the difficulties we have is um, mobilizing public opinion, and I think as I think public health uh, doctors need to develop a stronger voice. One problem I encountered was that uh, there were lots of organizations that were concerned about the impact of alcohol on health, but they weren't necessarily singing from the same hymn sheet. So about five years ago, we formed the Alcohol Health Alliance in the UK, which is now made up of more than 35 organizations, all independent of the drinks industry, all concerned about the, the level of harm we're seeing. And it's a very loose alliance. We don't interfere with individual organizations' right to say what they like. But I think, in fact, we, we by and large, um, uh, see the same problems and, and would like to see the same policy changes. And so uh, 
by coming together, we're able to make sure that we're, that we're, that we're singing in unison, or at least like a choir, uh, in harmony, rather than, than, than crossing each other. Uh, the World Health, World Health Organization has undoubtedly been a leader in the field of alcohol uh, in terms of uh, developing uh, model strategies, of uh, plotting the, the, the levels of harm in different countries, but the WHO resources are very limited and I think we really need to get the United Nations more involved. They really got involved in tobacco. Uh, I think we need to get uh, the harm from alcohol to, to, to uh, communities worldwide higher on the UN agenda.